Welcome to lecture 4.1, homomorphisms and isomorphisms. To motivate this important topic, you've probably noticed that throughout the course, we've said things like, this group has the same structure as that group, or this group is isomorphic to that group. However, we've never really spelled out the details about what this means. In this lecture, we will introduce a special type of function between groups called a homomorphism. An isomorphism is a special type of homomorphism. The Greek roots homo and morph together mean same shape. There are two situations where homomorphisms arrive. The first is when one group is a subgroup of another. The second is when one group is a quotient of another. The corresponding homomorphisms are called embeddings and quotient maps. Also in this chapter, and by chapter I mean starting with th this lecture 4.1 up to lecture I think 4.6 or 4.7, we will completely classify all finite abelian groups and get a taste of a few more advanced topics such as the four isomorphism theorems, commutator subgroups, and automorphisms. Let's start with a motivating example. Consider the statement, Z3 is a subgroup of D3. Here is a visual. Here's the group Z3, which consists of 0, 1, and 2. And here's the group D3, which consists of E, R, R squared, F, R, F, and R squared, F. The group D3 contains a size 3 cyclic subgroup, namely the one generated by R right here, which is identical to Z3 in structure only. None of the elements of Z3, namely 0, 1, and 2, are actually in the group D3. When we say that Z3 is a subgroup of D3, we really mean that the structure of Z3 shows up in D3. In particular, there is a bijective correspondence, that means 1 to 1 and onto between the elements in Z3 and those in the subgroup generated by R in D3. So when there's a bijection, that means there's a mapping, and here it is right here. Zero goes to the identity, one goes to R, and two goes to R squared. And furthermore, the relationship between the corresponding nodes is the same. So we're not just arbitrarily mapping these three nodes, zero, one, and two, to these three nodes in any order, we actually want the identity to get mapped to the identity, and then one goes to R, and two goes to R squared. So, if you squint your eyes, and you can't read whether this is zero, one, or two, or this is E, R, or R squared, these two groups are essentially the same in structure. A homomorphism is the mathematical tool for succinctly expressing precise structural correspondences. It is a function between groups satisfying a few natural properties. So this function here is a homomorphism from Z3 to D3. And that's the topic of this lecture. Continuing our previous example, we say that this function maps elements of Z3 to elements of D3. We may write this as if we were describing a function between sets. Phi is a function that sends z3 to d3. And here's a picture of that function right here. Now we can't always write down a succinct formula for this function, but in this special case, we can. We can actually say that phi of n is r to the n, because this function is taking either 0, 1, or 2, and it's sending it to e to the 0, e to the 1, and e to the 2. The group from which a function originates is the domain. In our example, that's z3. This is what you would expect if we were in the land of calculus and we had a function. The domain is the input. Same thing if we were defining a function between sets. But this part is a little bit different. The group into which the function maps is the codomain. So in our example, that's d3. Now you may have expected me to say range here, 
but it's a little bit different because the range of the function is not this entire group d3. The range of the function is this is just the subgroup consisting of three nodes. And in fact, in group theory, we don't usually use the word range as you would expect. We use the word image instead. So the elements in the codomain that the function maps to are called the image of the function. In our example, it's this subgroup of size 3. And we denote that as im of phi. We just usually say image of phi. So the image of phi is phi of the domain, the group G, in our example, Z3. So it is the set of all elements of the form phi of G where G ranges in the input or the domain. At last, here is our formal definition. A homomorphism is a function phi between two groups satisfying the following important property. Phi of A times B equals phi of A times phi of B. And that's for all A and B in the domain. Note that the operation A times B, which here we're just writing as AB, is occurring in the domain, while this operation, phi of A times phi of B, which again we're writing without the dot, occurs in the codomain. So even though I'm writing this as a multiplication, it may be the, the case that the binary operation is something else. Like in this case, it's addition. So up here, this requirement right here would have to be replaced with phi of A plus B. Although this requirement would stay the same because our binary operation in D3 is multiplication. Here is a very important remark. Not every function from one group to another is indeed a homomorphism. The condition at phi of a, b equals phi of a times phi of b means that the map phi preserves the structure of g. And it should not be obvious why this is true. This is what I hope to convince you of in the next few slides. Let's try to understand this condition using several visual interpretations. So we'll do both Cayley diagrams and multiplication tables. So in the Cayley diagram world, in the domain, we have A times B equals C. So that means we start at a node A, and then we apply B, which represents a path, and we get to some node, let's call it C. C is equal to A times B. Now we apply the homomorphism phi, and we're now in the codomain. So in the codomain, A gets mapped to some node phi of A, C gets mapped to some node phi of C, and B, this path, gets mapped to some other element with, which represents some other path phi of B. So how does this condition come in? Phi of AB equals phi of A times phi of B. Well, phi of AB is the image of this node C. So C gets mapped to phi of C. And that has to be equal to, or this node is precisely where you end up if you start at phi of A up here, and then you apply the path phi of B. So this condition in terms of Cayley diagrams says that this path B between nodes A and C, when you apply phi, gets mapped as a path phi of B between the nodes phi of A and phi of C. Okay, let's look at the multiplication table interpretation. So when we say a, b equals c, that means in the multiplication table, a times b is some group element c. And then let's apply phi to that. So phi of a, b is the entry, the image of c. So if this is a, b, then phi of C is phi of AB. And this condition says that 
that entry, that element, has to be the product of phi of A times phi of B. So hopefully, you're starting to get some intuition as to why this unusual condition in the definition of a homomorphism really means that the map phi preserves the structure of the group G. Likely, at this point, you're still trying to piece together these ideas and get the concepts to click. So let's do an example. Consider the function phi that takes an integer and reduces it modulo 5. So you input an integer and you output that integer mod 5. So phi of n is equal to n modulo 5. Now, the group operation is additive, so the homomorphism property becomes the following. Phi of A plus B equals phi of A plus phi of B. And, get, and again, that's because the binary operation in both the domain and the codomain is addition. In plain English, this just says that one can first add the numbers together and then reduce modulo 5. Or, on the right-hand side, you can first reduce the numbers modulo 5, phi of A and phi of B, and then add them together. Or add them together modulo 5. Here are some pictures of that, mimicking what we did in the previous slide. So let's suppose you have two numbers, 19 and 8, and let's add them together. So in the Cayley diagram, 19 plus 8 leads you to 27. So if you want to reduce this modulo 5, one way to do it is add these together to get 27 and then reduce modulo 5 to get us to 2. That is the left-hand side of this equation, phi of 27. And the homomorphism condition says that has to be the same as the right-hand side, which is what you get if you first reduce 19 mod 5 to get 4, if you reduce 8 mod 5 to get 3, and then you add those together, modulo 5, 4 plus 3 is indeed 2. Now let's look at the multiplication table interpretation of this. And actually, in this case, it's an addition table because our binary operations are addition. So in the domain, we have 19 plus 8 equals 27. So phi of A plus B says phi of 27 is 2. That has to be the same as phi of A plus phi of B. In other words, the entry in the table that you get from starting at 4 and adding 3, 4 plus 3 mod 5 is 2. Okay, so let's look into different types of homomorphisms, and we'll start with an example. Here's a homomorphism, let's call it theta, from Z3 to C6, and it's defined as follows. Theta of n equals r to the 2n. So it maps 0 to r to the 0, 1 to r squared, and 2 to r to the 4th. It is easy to check that theta of a plus b equals theta of a times theta of b. And here we have to use addition in the left-hand side of this because this is an additive group. And we use multiplication on the right-hand side because the codomain is multiplicative, C6. And let's check this at least in one example. Let's check that theta of 1 plus 1 equals theta of 1 times theta of 1. So theta of 1 plus 1 is what you get when you do 1 plus 1 to 2, and then you apply theta, gets you to R4. And that has to be equal to theta of 1 times theta of 1. So is R4 equal to theta of 1, which is R squared, times theta of 1? Absolutely. And if you want to, you can check the other few cases, 1 plus 2 and 2 plus 2, that those work too. 
So the red arrow in Z3 is representing the element 1, the generator 1, and that gets mapped, that one step path gets mapped to the two step path, which represents R2 in C6. And similarly, a two step path here gets mapped to a four step path over here, because theta of 1 plus 1 equals theta of 1 times theta of 1. A homomorphism, phi, from g to h, that is 1 to 1, or if you prefer, injective, like the one above, is called an embedding. The group g, the domain, embeds into h as a subgroup. If theta is not 1 to 1, then the homomorphism is a quotient. If phi of g equals h, so if the image is equal to the entire codomain, which is not the case here, or in the previous examples that we saw, then as a function, phi is onto or surjective. A homomorphism that is both injective, recall that means one to one, and surjective, which means onto, is an isomorphism. So when we have an isomorphism from a group G to a group H, from the domain to the codomain, which is not the case in this example, that means that both groups have the same structure. So there is a structure preserving bijection between the groups. Up here, we have a homomorphism that is an embedding because it's one to one, but it's not onto, so it's not an isomorphism. And finally, an automorphism is an isomorphism from a group to itself. So sometimes there are non-trivial maps from a group to itself that also preserve the structure. And we'll see some of those in upcoming lectures fairly soon. Here's an important remark. If we know where a homomorphism maps the generators of a group G, then we can figure out where it maps all elements of G. Here's an example. Let's suppose that we have a homomorphism from Z3 to Z6 that maps the generator of Z3, that is 1, to the element 4. Using this information, we can construct the rest of phi. Phi of 2 is phi of 1 plus 1, which because phi is a homomorphism, must be equal to phi of 1 plus phi of 1. Both of these are equal to 4. So that's 4 plus 4, which in Z6 is equal to 2. And finally, the other element in the group, 0, phi of 0 equals phi of 1 plus 2, because 0 is 1 plus 2 in Z3. So that is phi of 1 plus phi of 2 by the defining homomorphism property. And that is 4, phi of 1 is 4, and phi of Two, we just determined is 2, so 4 plus 2 in Z6 is 0. Now, let's suppose that we have a group with two generators, call them A and B, and we have a homomorphism from that group G to another group H. And let's suppose that we know where the generators get mapped to, so we know what phi of A and phi of B are. And let's assume that both of these groups are multiplicative. So using this information, we can determine the image of any element in G because we know the image of the generators. For example, let's take the element G, little g, which is a cubed b squared ab. Then phi of b is phi of 
A times A times A times B times B times A times B using the homomorphism property is phi of A times phi of A times phi of A times phi of B times phi of B times phi of A times phi of B. Now, let me ask you a question. What do you think phi of A inverse would be? We will answer that question right here. So here's a proposition. Let's suppose we have a homomorphism from G to H. Now these things being groups both have identity elements, but they might be different identities. Like one might be a group of matrices, one might be a group of functions. So let's denote the identity of G by 1 sub G, or just 1 G, and the identity of H by 1 sub H, or just 1 H. Then, phi of 1 G equals phi of 1 H. In other words, phi sends the identity to the identity. So it sends the identity of the domain to the identity of the codomain. And second, phi of G inverse equals phi of G inverse. So phi sends inverses in the domain to inverses in the codomain. Let's prove these. So for the first one, pick any group element, little g. Now, phi of g is in the codomain h. And what I claim is that phi of the identity of g, phi of 1g, is in fact the identity of h. So let's test this theory. Phi of 1 times phi of g, because phi is a homomorphism, is phi times the identity times g, which is, of course, phi of g, which is the identity in h times phi of g. So yes, phi of the identity in g is equal to the identity in h. In other words, phi of the identity times this element equals that element. So that has to be the identity. So that proves the first part of this proposition. And let's do the second now. Again, let's take any little g in our domain and observe that phi of g times phi of g inverse by the homomorphism property is phi of g times g inverse, which is phi of the identity in g. And by the first part, we know that is equal to the identity in H. Now, since phi of G times phi of G inverse is the identity, that means that these things are inverses of each other. So in particular, phi of G inverse, i.e. this here, is just the inverse of phi of G. And that is exactly what we wanted to prove. Next, a word of caution. Just because a homomorphism from G to H is determined by the image of its generators does not mean that every such image will work. In other words, you could not arbitrarily choose where the generators get sent to. For example, suppose we try to define a homomorphism from Z3 to Z4 by sending the generator of Z3 1 to 1 in Z4. Let's see what happens. Well, we get phi of 2 is phi of 1 plus 1, because, well, trivially 2 is 1 plus 1. But by our homomorphism property, remember our groups are additive, this is equal to phi of 1 plus phi of 1, which is equal to 2, because these things we've declared to be equal to 1. However, phi of 0, well, 0 in Z3 is 1 plus 1 plus 1. So phi of 0 is phi of 1 plus 1 plus 1. By the homomorphism property, this is phi of 1 
plus phi of 1 plus phi of 1, which is 1 plus 1 plus 1, which is 3. However, this is impossible because we just saw that the identity has to get mapped to the identity. So 0 has to get mapped to 0, but it doesn't up here. Phi of 0 gets mapped to 3, which is not the identity in Z4. So in other words, there is no such homomorphism from Z3 to Z4 that sends 1 to 1. Now, that's not to say that there isn't a homomorphism between these groups at all. Note that there is always the trivial homomorphism between two groups. You can always define a map from G to H that sends everything in G to the identity in H. Here is an exercise that will be on your homework, although I encourage you to think about it now because it's very related to what we just did. Show that there is no embedding from the integers modulo n to the integers, assuming that n is greater than or equal to 2. Because if n is equal to 1, this is just the trivial group. And actually, I want you to show something slightly stronger. Show that any homomorphism from Zn to the integers must be the trivial homomorphism. This one right here. It must send 1 to the identity, which is the identity in Z, and therefore it must send everything to the identity. So the only homomorphism from Zn to Z is the trivial homomorphism. Recall that an isomorphism is a homomorphism phi from a group G to a group H that is one-to-one -one and onto. So in that case, it is a bijection from G to H that preserves the structure, and we say that the groups G and H are isomorphic. Now, two isomorphic groups may name their elements differently, and they may look different based on the layouts or choice of generators for their Cayley diagrams. But once we have an isomorphism, an explicit mapping between them, that guarantees that they have the same structure. When two groups, G and H, have an isomorphism between them, we say that G and H are isomorphic, and this is the notation that we use. So G is isomorphic to H. Let's do an example. The roots of the polynomial x to the fourth minus 1 are called the fourth roots of unity. If you draw these on the complex plane, so here's the complex plane and here's the unit circle, then they exist right here at these corners. This is 1, this is i, this is negative 1, and this is negative i. And think about how this generalizes. If this is the polynomial x to the n minus 1, then you have the nth roots of unity, because these are the complex numbers that when you raise them to the nth power, you get back 1. In that case, well, of course, 1 has that property, but the other n minus 1, turns out they are equally spaced around the unit circle, like this. So in this case, when n equals 4, you get these four complex numbers. These, of course, form a group under multiplication. Notice that if you multiply any two of these numbers, you get back one of those numbers. And in fact, they form a subgroup of the non-zero complex numbers. And if you think about it, you take the complex numbers and throw away zero, those form a group. A y, the identity, of course, is 1. It's closed under the operation a plus bi times c plus di. That's a complex number. And finally, every complex number that's not 0 has an inverse. So a plus bi, so let's suppose that's, that's out here. What's the inverse of this? I think the best way to see that is to put it in polar coordinates. 
So this is equal to r e to the i theta, where r is the length of this, this line, which is, of course, the square root of a squared plus b squared. And so if you take, so if you write this as r e to the i theta, then the inverse of that is 1 over r times e to the minus i theta. So if you multiply those together, those things will cancel, and these will cancel, and you get back 1. So I will leave it as an exercise to figure out what this is in a plus bi notation. So well, the picture of it is this thing here has to have the negative angle. So let's down here. So this has to be negative theta. And this is, and the length has to be reciprocal. So if this is length r, this is length 1 over r. So this is 1 over r times e to the negative i theta. And when you multiply complex numbers together, recall that their angles add. So these two angles add up, you get 0. And the lengths multiply. So r times 1 over r gets you back to 1. So throughout the course, we'll see some more examples involving complex numbers. And I like doing these in a little bit of detail because it helps you recall some of these basic facts of complex numbers that you likely learned a few years ago and haven't really used them since and so have likely forgotten. And once in a while, you see concepts like the nth roots of unity that maybe you haven't seen at all, but they fit in naturally with some of the basic properties that you know about complex numbers. Okay, so that was a bit of a tangent. Let's, let's return to the roots of this polynomial, which are 1i, negative 1, and negative i, which I said is a subgroup of the non-zero complex numbers under multiplication. The following map exhibits an isomorphism between z4 and the fourth roots of unity. So you can see it structurally that these four roots of unity under multiplication, well, i is a generator, because if you keep multiplying i by itself, you get negative 1, negative i, and back to 1. So there's a natural isomorphism from z4 to r of 4, the roots of unity, sending the identity to the identity, the generator 1, well, let's send that to the generator i, and that forces 2 to negative 1 and 3 to negative i. And if you look at this for a second, you realize that this map is just the following formula. It sends the element, or the number k, to i to the k. This is i squared, this is i cubed, and this is i to the fourth, or just i to the zero. So these two groups are structurally the same, which we've known for a long time if I had shown you these two Cayley diagrams, but now we actually have the formalism of how to define a map between the two that satisfies phi of a plus b equals phi of a times, oops, phi of a, let me erase that, times phi of b, and it is a bijection. In the example on the previous slide, it was obvious that the two groups were isomorphic because the Cayley diagrams were identical in structure. However, sometimes the isomorphism is less visually obvious because the Cayley diagrams, given our canonical choice of generators, might have a different structure. For example, the following map, phi, is an isomorphism from z6 to c6. Now, of course, you know that these two groups are isomorphic. They're both cyclic of order 6. But if I had just shown you the Cayley diagrams presented like this, you might not have guessed right away that they represent structurally similar groups. And that's because I have an odd choice for the generators of C6. I chose R2 and R3 as a generating set when I didn't need to. 
but maybe I did it for some other reason. Maybe I wanted to highlight the difference between this Cayley diagram and the Cayley diagram of D3, which is similar, except one of these cycles goes in the opposite direction. So let's actually prove that this map is an isomorphism. So I claim that it's clear that it's a bijection, that the map from k, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, up to r to the k, which is the powers of r, is clearly 1 to 1 and odd 2. So this is a bijection. So why is it a homomorphism? So to check that, we actually need to check the homomorphism property. So be careful. The operation on the left is addition, and the operation on the right is multiplication. So let's check. What do we have to check? Phi of, let's say, a plus b. That's what we have over here. So phi of a plus b. And we have to show that this is equal to phi of a times phi of b. So let's follow our nose. Let's write down what this is equal to. Phi of a plus b is equal to r to the a plus b. That's the definition of phi right here. Now what do you want to do with phi of a plus b? Or sorry, r to the a plus b. Well, you probably are looking at this and thinking, I can write that as r to the a times r to the b. And now I can write this as phi of a times phi of b, because that's the definition of phi. And that's what we needed to show. So yes, phi of a plus b equals phi of a times phi of b, so this mapping is a bijective homomorphism, and therefore it is an isomorphism between these two groups. Here is another non-obvious isomorphism between two groups that we're familiar with, namely S3, the symmetric group on three elements, which is a group of order 6 canonically generated by the transitions 1, 2, and 2, 3, and the group D3, also a group of 6 elements, but canonically generated by R and F. So here's a picture right here to motivate why these two things should be isomorphic. So D3 represents all rigid motions of this triangle. So there's three rotations and three reflections. And S3 represents all permutations of the numbers 1, 2, and 3. So if you number these corners of the triangle with 1, 2, and 3, then every rigid motion, every rotation and reflection, represents a permutation of the corners and vice versa. Every permutation can be represented by a rigid motion. Now this does not happen between S4 and D4 because once you have a square, then there are transpositions that you cannot achieve through rigid motions. Like you can't just swap two consecutive corners on a square without swapping the others. So given this picture as a guide, let's suppose that a reflection across the vertical axis is F. So that reflection fixes the corner 1 and it swaps corners 2 and 3. So let's define the map phi that associates the pr permutation, or the transposition, 2, 3 with the element F. And then if R is a 120 degree rotation, it's easy to check that if you rotate twice, so that sends so that that sends this one over to here and then you reflect so r squared f in fact fixes 3 and it swaps the corners 1 and 2 so we can define phi of the transposition 1 2 as being r squared f so since we've defined phi on the generators of S3, that determines everything else. Now let's go over to the Cayley diagram and let's try to fill in all of the, uh, go over here and try to fill in all of these nodes with transpositions. 
So the identity gets mapped to the identity. That doesn't change. 1, 2 gets mapped to r squared f. So r squared f, we can label this with 1, 2. 2, 3 gets mapped to f. So this we can label with 2, 3. And so now let's label the other three nodes. Well, let's see. So phi of 1, 2, 2, 3 is phi of what's 1, 2, and 2, 3. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. So f that means 1 goes to 3. And then 3 goes to 2. So 3 goes to 2. So phi of 1, 3, 2 equals phi, oops, phi of 1, 2. I'm going to omit the parentheses. I don't need, well, I can fit them in. Phi of 1, 2 times phi of 2, 3. And that is r squared f times f, which is r squared. So in other words, r squared is just the element can be labeled with 1, 3, 2. Now let's keep going with this. I'm running out of room, so I think I'll use this, this top space. Um, so phi, let's see, so phi of 1, 3, 2 squared is phi of 1, 2, 3, that 3 cycle. So if, if you square a 3 cycle, you get another 3 cycle. And so that is, so phi of 1, 3, 2 times phi of 1, 3, 2, which is r squared times r squared, which is r to the fourth, or just r. So this node here, gets in the bottom right, gets labeled with 1, 3, sorry, 1, 2, 2, 3. And then we only have one left. So this rf, we don't have any choice. That has to be labeled with 1, 3. And I encourage you to check that this indeed, this indeed works. So in other words, the R, the R arrows, a rotation of this triangle is the permutation 1 goes to 2 goes to 3. And indeed, corner 1 goes to corner 2, 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes to 1. And if you do that twice, you get the rotation in the opposite direction. And these are the three reflections. And the three reflections corresponds to, to trans, transposing corners. So F transposes 2 and 3. RF is this one that's not labeled. That transposes 1 and 3. And R squared F transposes 1 and 2. So that's this. So this is just a formalization of the isomorphism, the st structural similarity between the groups S3 and D3, which may not have been obvious if you had just b been shown up front these two Cayley diagrams. This will be our last example of the lecture, and it involves a group that's called the general linear group, denoted GLN of R. So it's a set of invertible n by n matrices with real valued entries. So that's why the R is right there. It is easy to see that this is a group under multiplication, because every matrix has an inverse. If you multiply two invertible matrices, you get another invertible matrix. And there's an obvious identity matrix. Recall from a few lectures ago, the quaternion group, Q4. This was the group generated by I, J, and K, although we, we don't actually need K in the generating set. And all three of these things were like the square root of negative 1. If you squared them, you got negative 1. And then if you multiplied i times j, 
you got K. Remember that group? The following set of eight matrices forms an isomorphic group under multiplication, where I is the 4 by 4 identity matrix. So these three matrices, well, at least the positive versions, if we call them I, J, and K, then their relations of multiplication behave exactly like these relations up here. Both, or all three of these, square to become the identity matrix. And if you multiply I times J, you get K. Formally, this means that we have an embedding from Q4, this group here, into the general linear group for n equals 4. And that embedding sends I to this matrix, J to this matrix, and K to that matrix. And you can check that. It's easy to check that phi of I, J equals phi of K and phi of I times phi of J. So this is a structural preserving map. Now it's not onto because this is obviously an infinite group, but we can say it's onto its its image. So these eight matrices form a group isomorphic to the quaternion group. When this happens, or in this case, we say that Q4 is represented by a set of matrices. So here's an abstract group that we can actually realize as a finite collection of matrices. Many other groups can be represented by matrices. Let me ask you this. Can you think about how to represent groups like the Klein-4 group, cyclic groups, or symmetric groups using matrices? There are very intuitive ways to do this, though they may not be obvious right away. But if you play around with them, I bet you could figure them out. And there is at least one homework question on this topic.